Well, hi folks, it's uh, Rob Daywell again. This time we're talking about uh, corrections, lesson 10, government, and that's a plus, government plus private prison. So what we're really looking at is different styles and management of uh, both private and public institutions. Now, here's the thing. I've been to a lot of different prisons, as I've told you before, and I've been in private prisons, and I've been in uh, government-owned prisons, and it's kind of funny, but one of them is only about 30 miles from the other one. So, um, honestly, I didn't think they were that different, but as I've talked to some of the employees and uh, uh, even inmates, uh, it seems like, at least, according to Stacy that I interviewed that you can see uh, in Module 4, um, the, the private prisons are even easier on the prisoners than the uh, government-run prisons. Uh, and so, which I found uh, interesting, uh, because like I say, just from a uh, casual observer position, I didn't really notice that much difference. Uh, <clears throat> so, basically, what we've got is um, going to talk a little bit about the corrections officer and what they are uh, doing uh, in their jobs. Um, there is a uh, progression from what was originally called a watchman, so all they did is just watch to make sure nobody tried to escape, to what they call a correctional officer, and that is what we call the prof professionalization of uh, corrections uh, officers. And so it used to be called prison guard, which was uh, basically a watchman type position. And the watchman is actually a tradition in the United States. We had those uh, long before we had policemen. And every able-bodied man in colonial United States had to serve a stint as a watchman. And the watchman's job was to walk around and um, basically start the hue and cry if there was a fire, if there was a fight, if someone was trying to rob somebody, if someone was trying to break in someone's home, or one of the big things that they had back then was what they called eavesdropping. And eavesdropping literally means what it says, and that is that one person would hang over the edge of another person's home on the roof and stick their ear down by the window and listen to what people were saying or doing like in their bedroom or something like that. So the watchman was to shoo off eavesdroppers and burglars and robbers or start what we call the hue and cry to try to get uh, people to assist in uh, stopping a robbery or catching a criminal. Now, a way a long time ago, in about 1800, we started to see the progression from watchman in law enforcement to the professional police officer and that continues to this day. And many would argue, well, there's no such thing as a professional police officer. Uh, others say, well, yeah, look at all the skills they have to have today uh, just to work in that field. Corrections officers have lagged about 100 years behind and really haven't developed, maybe some would say 150, have not really developed as professionals until more recent years, probably starting, I would say, around 1950 although there was some talk of this before that as far as getting an organized movement really in place and being effective it did not really happen. Now one of the problems that you have as far as professionalization of corrections officers is the problem they do get low wages uh, and they work a lot of hours to make up for the fact that they get low wages. Same way with police, a lot of police have two jobs work as a policeman and a security guard or a bouncer or uh, I've known guys that start their own little uh, bad check company where on their spare time they go and collect bad checks. Now one of the things on uh, racial and ethnic diversity is for many years there are obviously no female corrections officers, there were no minority corrections officers, that was like unheard of. And so there were a lot of problems in terms of racial and ethnic discrimination by corrections officers or back then watchmen or prison guards and that has started to alleviate since the 70s and the reason is just the sheer number of corrections officers that every state or private company needs and there is a high turnover rate 
So they've had to open the doors to just about anybody that's willing. So in the case of Stacy that we talked about in the interview, she was um, very pleased with her job uh, and she worked a lot of hours. It was stressful, it was dangerous, uh, but she liked what she did. She really enjoyed it. She even said she loved it. But <clears throat> here again, she's a female corrections officer supervising 200 men, you know, uh, and so you wonder how that could even be done. But she's one of a group, as she said, they have what they call a CERT team when it's necessary. Uh, as much as we say, well, they look out for each other and some of the prisoners look out for the female corrections officers. There is a recent case out of, I think, California, somewhere on the West Coast, where a corrections officer was actually just a chaplain's assistant. She's supposed to help the chaplain just put out like the hymnals and keep order in the church while the prisoners were in there. Where she was working by herself one day and a prisoner somehow got broke away from a work detail and went in and raped her and killed her. So safety can be a problem obviously for any corrections officer but primarily speaking uh, they do work out systematic ways to avoid that. Sometimes though it is just a matter of if you treat the prisoners fair and square, they treat you fair and square. If you want to be a hard case, then they are going to react the same way against you. So people again say, well, we're just not tough enough on these prisoners, but there's some practical realities at work because, uh, you know, you got to go along to get along to a certain extent. And that's really true when your life is on the line. Well, female corrections officers still not accepted by a number of different people. They, A number of uh, males say, well, they just can't pull their weight. Uh, if they do get in a scuffle, they're always having to call for help. You know, just different things like that. Uh, the overall, though, statistical uh, numbers on female corrections officers are very good. And so this does seem to be... Uh, a good move on the part of the government in terms of the needs as well as the private private industry. Now one of my things I would point out the biggest problem with um, working as a corrections officer is stress and burnout. You are necessary, to, it's necessary to be on your toes, it's like being a soldier in a war. If you did this for 20 years you'd be in a war for 20 years. So uh, there is a high burnout rate. There's a lot of people that move on. But another thing that people tend to do is they move up. Like I said earlier, the problem you get into is the long hours. A lot of them work 12-hour days, uh, maybe four days a week. Some of them work 12-hour days, five hours a week, or five days a week. And so it's very uh, difficult uh, type work just for the time that has to be put in. Uh, and so then mental health in terms of the staff, mental health staff, counseling, recreation, a number of these positions are trying to professionalize this, increase the opportunities for people to work on some of their uh, anger issues uh, and jealousy issues and things like that. And at the far end of the spectrum, uh, the, the ones that are child molesters, uh, and pedophiles, uh, they try to work with them in terms of behavior management to avoid problems with their uh, desires and, and needs. They're, they're never really completely cured, but there are ways that they can be controlled. Uh, extreme cases, like we said, of uh, child molesting end up going into a mental institution after they finish their second, at least, uh, stint in prison. Uh, we can also look quickly at religious staff. Uh, religious staff, usually there are chaplains involved. Uh, this takes a tremendous commitment. Some of the actual uh, faith-based organizations just spend a huge amount of time in the jails and prisons. I had a pastor uh, that was in the jails all the time and received a lot of uh, negative uh, feedback from members of his board of trustees which I thought it was extremely uh, admirable. Uh, academic and vocational, this is in the area of training uh, and teaching. A lot of people uh, involved in GED. There are a few college programs that go inside and actually serve the prisoners. Uh, one of the things we get into is 
uh, management. We've already talked about the wages paid to many prisoners, only 15 cents an hour on average. Some get as little as 10. Uh, and so what ends up happening is that the idea of it are really is to rehabilitate the prisoner, but the problem with it is they get paid so little that it causes more anger, uh, more jealousy. It causes um, uh, people not to be rehabilitated. It, may, it actually causes them to reoffend because they don't get paid enough money to make it worth their while. Uh, private sector oftentimes steps in to the prisons and says, like I've, I've uh, seen in a couple of different places, uh, let's have these women's prisoners make ink pens. Uh, and you know, that's, they can get paid piecemeal. The more they make, the more they get paid. Uh, but here again, is, the, is it a living wage that they're receiving? And again, yes, it's true that some of that wage should go to the government to pay for their keep. Uh, no question about it. It should also go to pay their child support if they have children at home. Uh, but it just needs to be sensible and understandable so people see, well, uh, here's what it, I get and here's what it costs and so that it's more visible and on top of the table instead of some of this underworld stuff that goes on. Uh, there's also uh, government type uses, like I said, in Terre Haute Prison where they have them make furniture for government buildings, they make blankets for the army, they make a lot of products for use even in the prisons all around the country in the U.S. Uh, Bureau of Prisons. Uh, there is a corporate model, which is a model where they're just like uh, any other business, where they're like, well, these are resources, and they bid uh, against each other for who's going to uh, get these uh, jobs and these uh, opportunities, and so uh, that is an important part of it. Well, privatization, there's a lot of uh, discussion about privatization. One of the arguments on privatization is that the uh, number of uh, states like Minnesota, for example, are very much opposed to private prisons. They say that they um, are cheap, they don't feed the prisoners well, they don't take out care of them well. On the other hand, um, based on the on-the-ground interview with Stacy. Uh, just a few miles from her place of employment uh, in a prison, private prison owned by GEO, she's saying, hey, they treat the prisoners really well. So that's one perspective. Probably a more effective uh, research would be then to go talk to one or two prisoners and ask them if they think they're being treated well. So it'll be interesting. Uh, some say, you know, they don't manage uh, as well because they're trying to save money to make money in private prisons. Uh, but all in all, uh, it is uh, seeming to work at this prison in Newcastle. And frankly, from the 30,000 foot area that I look at it, I don't see it as being that much different. Privatization can be misdirection. What can happen is private prisons can lobby and try to get control of the uh, ideas in the legislature. And they even have, in some cases, uh, given bribes to judges in the juvenile facilities in Pennsylvania. Uh, two judges went to prison because they're putting kids that had absolutely no business being locked up into a private lockup because they got a kickback for every uh, child that they put into a juvenile lockup. So same thing could very well be happening in public prisons as well as in um, private prisons, but it seems like the focus is more on private prisons, that they're trying to get states to create more private prisons when they really don't need private prisons. They need other things like treatment, uh, education, uh, job training, uh, this type of thing. So uh, it's almost like the fix is in in some of these states where some of these large corporations have a lock on lobbying the legislature and they pay them in order to create more prisons when they really don't need them. So you're seeing that in most uh, large states like New York and California, prison populations are going down substantially. But in some southern states, uh, this good old boy network is in place and they continue to put people uh, in prison for very uh, small things uh, such as drugs, uh, just usage of drugs, not dealing drugs. You know, when we look at drugs, I mean, we need to focus on, are these guys dealing drugs to kids? 
I mean, those are the ones that need to be off the street. Uh, if they choose to use drugs and that's all they've got is a small quantity of drugs for their own use, well, say they kill themselves. Well, that's on them. They chose that path. Uh, so why does the taxpayer have to get involved? I mean, you know, uh, dealing here again, a little bit more uh, difficult problem than just the using, but obviously less of a problem than dealing to kids. So I think the scale of this is kind of out of whack that everybody that has anything to do at all with uh, drugs uh, are being put in prison and it should we should rethink that I think again uh, and give that a strong look. Same way to nonviolent offenders, probably get into you have petty thieves, people like that that take beds that need to be for violent offenders. And if we don't have enough beds for violent offenders, then the first to go should be the nonviolent offender. So I think it's a major need to rethink this whole correctional process. Uh, thanks for watching. That's basically it for this time. Again, if you need me, robdaywaltme.com. Lesson 10, Government and Private Prisons. Thank you. Ta-da!